What's up, YouTube? Uh, I apologize for earlier. I'm just uh, getting used to this uh, timing of uh, trying to get content out and trying to work uh, a normal job. Meanwhile, Mike prepared to take a road trip. Mike's plan to go camping has taken a little twist. He's now taking a corpse with him that he needs to hide. I need you to go clean the garage. Clean the garage. Okay? And guess what? Didn't clean the garage. Mike headed north for over an hour to a peaceful place where he liked to relax and unwind. And the place he actually went to was uh, uh, outside of uh, Flagstaff. Very, very far away. But he just made one of the biggest mistakes ever. You'll find out here in a minute what it was. It was a campsite he called Heaven. But that night, he was recreating a scene from Hell. He spent the rest of the night in the forest, in the dark, cutting the head off the body, pulling the teeth out of the head. Cutting the hands off the body. Yeah, just to warn you, this is a probably a, a trigger warning, and a, um, anybody under 18 should probably not be watching this video. So just to put that out there. I'm cutting the fingertips, or the soft part of the fingertips, off the fingers. Mike's uh, cutting off the victim's head and finger pad is one of the few really well-calculated, methodical things that he undertook. And it wasn't a person anymore. It was just a corpse. And in Mike's mind, it was just evidence that he was getting rid of. Investigators checked mobile phone records and discovered five calls had been made to the same number the day Robert Miller disappeared. Come here, girl. It's Becky. You know, that's funny because that's supposed to be a fake phone number, but the actual area code for our area is 388. So that's pretty weird. They wouldn't try to hide it up more than that. Yeah, you want to come party? A detective dialed the number. Becky Rawls answered. I don't even know why you're calling me. Becky said she'd met Robert while looking for a job, but had no idea where the missing man was. Why do I have to come to the police station? We needed to do an in-depth okay. interview with Becky to find out her involvement, if any. Hello? Mike. Police is after us. Did you tell him anything? I told him I didn't know him and I need to go there and Don't worry, just stay there, I'll be I'll be home soon. I love you. We attempted to bring her in for an interview, but she basically no showed us. Robert Miller's employer hired a plane to conduct an aerial search of the expansive desert surrounding Whitman, hoping to spot his van. Two days after the murder, police located the vehicle abandoned near the cemetery. His briefcase and work boots were inside, but there was no sign of Robert, his wallet, or his mobile phone. Investigate. Well, there was no really trying to hide that, I guess. I mean, they just parked. I mean, Women's Cemetery is right off of uh, a main road. Which I don't know what they were thinking, because 
it would have been pretty easily uh, seeable. So yeah, not clean the garage, not hiding the van. You can see the uh, where it's going. <laughs> were alarmed to find out Becky Roars was still actively receiving calls from that missing phone. We needed to find that phone to see who was placing the phone calls. Investigators then received an anonymous tip-off claiming Becky Roars' boyfriend, Mick Murdoch, killed Robert Miller. At that point in the investigation, we were only armed with the information that Mark Murdoch had beaten him and that he was dead, yet his phone is still being used. Hello? The obvious plan was to locate the phone, locate Mike Murdoch, and attempt to locate the victim. Witnesses told them that Mike had loaded up his horse trailer and left town. We knew that he was camping in Yavapai County. We did an attempt to locate on him uh, through Yavapai County Sheriff's Office. Meanwhile, Becky panicked and decided to run away. She and her friend Susie looted Mike's house, pawned his belongings, and fled to a nearby hotel. Mike Murdoch was in hiding, and in an ironic twist, while this is where it fucked up. Cleaning a horse's hoof, he badly injured himself. He'd accidentally severed a major artery. His struggle. So the cops don't look for him in Yavapai County. He just cut himself really bad with the horse he picked. Guess where he's got to go. Or to stem the blood flow. He can't stop the blood. He sees that it's bleeding out fast, and he knows that he has to act fast, or he's not going to make it out of the forest alive yeah. himself. Time was running out for Mike Murdoch. While hiding out with Becky, Susie told a relative about the bloody events of that fateful night. The horrified family member gave police the names of everyone involved. Chad Stevens was the first one detectives were able to track down. He told them he watched Mike Murdoch beat Robert Miller to death. Investigators searched Mike and Becky's home. Inside the garage. And that is actual footage of the garage. Actual footage the garage that I hung in countless amounts of times. Countless. And I swear to God, there's something up with that garage. I mean, there's... I don't know. It's just... There's a hole made in the back of the garage. In the back wall. A, a hole made for someone to escape in just case of something happened. It was really weird. They found evidence of the gruesome crime. It was pretty much in the state that Mike Murdoch left it. There was a pool of blood behind one of the vehicles that had been covered up with dirt or horse manure. The garage turned torture chamber was still spattered with blood. An alert was issued for Mike Murdoch and his pickup truck. A tip came in that Becky Roars was at a Phoenix motel. Police wondered if the couple were together and whether Mike Murdoch would try and kill again. Sheriff's office! Don't go. Look at Piper. Oh my god. Becky was taken to the sheriff's office and was soon talking. Months of increasing drug abuse had taken its toll. You know, she turned state evidence on uh, my buddy's dad, and she just got out 
not recently, but it was a while back. She got like 2011 or 2012, I think. Honestly, I think it was. The name has been changed just in this show for uh, confidential purposes and everything. Uh, yeah. All on the former suburban housewife. In a rambling, often incoherent interview, she told police about her boyfriend's murderous rampage. Becky knew Mike was a cold-blooded killer, but his bad boy lifestyle had proved irresistible. I wanted to get away from him. It's like one of those, one of those relationships that you just, you know, just unhealthy, you know. And her boyfriend had made it clear she could be next. If I ever told anyone, if I was to ever tell anybody anything about this, then investigators got the call they'd been waiting for. Blood spattered Mike Murdor had arrived at a hospital's emergency unit, but could police catch him before he killed again? And it's pretty weird how he, uh, when they confront him, how he pretty much just gives himself up. He asks, he asks one question. If cops answer it, he don't even try to fight it. Police in Whitman, Arizona, were hunting for murder suspect Mike Murdor, who'd been battling to save his own life after accidentally severing an artery while disposing of his latest victim. Then they received a hot tip. Yeah, but Pike County Sheriff's Office located the vehicle registered to Mike Murdaugh at the medical center. We immediately had the vehicle secured and impounded. Mike Murda, Sheriff's Office, do you mind answering a few questions? What about? Took a look in your garage, searched it. Was it cleaned up? No, it wasn't. Not at all. He knew at that point that he had some major problems in Maricopa County. I guess you guys got enough on me, don't you? He stated he'd be going away for life. Things kind of got out of hand. How out of hand? Pretty out of hand. Oh, yeah. And he just starts telling everything. Well, this guy was bugging my girlfriend. He knew we knew what happened. And he started from the beginning and walked us through the entire situation. I had my girlfriend call him. To find him He's the gatekeeper of the information. He's going to decide what law enforcement learns about him. Got a party. It is one of his last efforts to stake out a power claim by controlling the conversation. We're just going to scare him. Mike said that it was his idea to invite the victim to his house and ultimately rob him, take his money, and basically teach him a lesson. We just put him in the trunk. We're going to scare him. I was trying to tap him. Before you know it, it was really late. Then what happened? got out of the trunk it escalated to the point that he knew that you'd have to kill him got out of the trunk then i hit him what'd you hit him with a meat tenderizer meat tenderizer i just kind of lose it sometimes before i knew it he was dead he just all of a sudden dead yeah he was dead i didn't think i hit him that hard and I had to get rid of the body. So I took it over to the campground. He described to me how he... And he just flats out describes everything right there. Just step by step by step how he did it. Doesn't show no remorse. Not even care in the fucking world. It's crazy how humans can be uh, desensitized in that kind of way. Look at... Uh, army and stuff. I mean, they're pretty much trained killers, I guess. He moved his hands, then I cut that off. his head, 
He described throwing the teeth out, throwing the fingerprint pads out. He described how he had the issue with his horse's shoe. And he had taken the knife out to clear the horse's shoe and ultimately stabbed himself in the leg. He said that's where he messed up. Is there anything else you uh, want to tell us? There was a guy that came to stay with us. He described in detail the drawn-out murder of Tim Johnson. Mike said that he... And then he admits to one that they didn't even know about. And probably wouldn't have. Maybe. Who knows? The next con, and that uh, he had been on a work release program. Put him in the canal. Becky Rawls confirmed Mike's tale, claiming it was a terrible thing to watch. I hear this wacky voice. I hit his head eight or nine times really hard. And then he gets teeth. Then this awful voice starts. Police trackers located the campsite. They found a sign Mike had left for Becky, giving directions to his remote hideaway. Camp was in a forest area. He had a tent set up, uh, the horse trailer. Mike Murdor wanted police to see his bloodthirsty work. He actually drew us a map showing where he had buried portions of the body. Various remains of Robert Miller were found scattered throughout the area. Knowing how bodies are identified, he said that he actually pulled the teeth and cut the fingerprint pads off his hands. He said as he's driving down the road, he slowly just threw them out the truck window. Police found the tools of Mike's butchery and remnants of Robert Miller's life littering the ground. We found the cell phone, we found a pager. There were numerous items that were ultimately identified as belonging to the victim. He had a good job, he had a brother who loved him, he had two kids, and he had a girlfriend. Unfortunately, he did choose to pursue some kind of adventure with Becky, and he paid for it with his life. Yes, he did. Mike Murdoch pleaded guilty to the murders of Robert Miller and Tim Johnson. He was sentenced to die and remains on death row. Murdoch, you have a cataclysm. See, but this video is a little old, so I don't, I don't think it's updated to 2014. He actually got off of death row because he didn't have a jury um, sentence him or something like that. And, uh, yeah, so it's kind of a mistrial, I guess, or something like So he got a uh, life without ever being on parole. Never seen a day of light again. Ever. It's a confluence of negative factors. You have his underlying personality structure, the meth, and then his overkill, his burnout from that, and his paranoia that just led him down this path. Becky Rawls pleaded guilty for her role in the murders and was sentenced to 22 years in prison. She continues to blame her boyfriend for the killings. There's no question that she had a reason to fear him. Yet she continued to be with him, and she did have opportunities to leave one way or another over the course of months. Opportunities in both cases of these murders to save the men. She could have, if nothing more, gone running down the street trying to attract attention. She could have used her influence over Mike to calm him down and get him to release the man in the trunk. Becky has a history of being described as a meek and powerless person. And that Mike could give power to her sort of in a voyeurist way where he was actually raining the blows down, but she got to watch it happen and that was her guy who was doing it. 
she was involved in enjoying those murders. She liked the power. She liked seeing that she had a big boyfriend that she could basically twist around her little finger, and he didn't even know it. He thought he was in control. Jimmy Smith pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, kidnapping, and armed robbery, and was released from prison in 2011. Susie Stevens maintained she knew nothing about Robert Miller's murder till she saw him lying in a pool of blood in Mike Murdoch's garage. She was charged with kidnapping and spent three years in prison. This drug ate away their capacity for judgment, for any kind of human connection, human compassion for someone who was suffering or endangered. It's really horrible what they were willing to do for their supply of meth. Becky had felt powerless most of her life. And here was a guy who was very powerful that she could control in her own way, and that's quite a wicked attraction. Well, after three parts, we finally got that wrapped up. And I uh, appreciate everybody for checking this out and watching it. And, uh, and until next time, uh, birthday chat out.